Good morning, it's 8 a.m. and I've just gotten out of bed to see a talk by Adrian Price Whelan. One upshot of virtual conferences is you can literally just roll out of bed. Day two, let's do it. turns out that, that many of these structures that we thought were actually distinct are not. They're interconnected. They're part of a larger response of the, of the outer disk to perturbations. So hopefully from, from this, this visualization, you get a sense of the really dramatic vertical disturbances that Sagittarius can excite in the disk that can kick stars up to 10 or 15 kiloparsecs away from the midplane, at least in, in the outer parts of the disk. Gaia has given us an incredible leap in terms of precision of astrometric measurements and in terms of sample size over any past astrometric survey. So it's really hard to overstate how groundbreaking Gaia is and, and will continue to be. Tidally locked, so they have one side of the planet facing the day side or facing the star, um, and then one uh, side of the planet constantly facing away from the star. So how would you depict that? What kind of story could you tell? To the degree that we can tell a story that's motivated by science, we really want to aspire to do that. So based off of kind of the idea of lava ocean planet, um, this tidal locking, um, and also uh, the idea that given the temperatures of the planet, that there might be these rock um, silicates that Talia was mentioning, in this case would actually vaporize into the sky um, forming clouds and so how do you kind of depict this sort of glittery um, uh, sand-like structure in the sky and so these were sort of the notional um, posters that were come together and you know and in the future hopefully when we do see these planets um, you know we can create visuals that are still beautiful um, you know but maybe less so those surprises where Tiffany tells us sorry there's no surface uh, I should know this number is 105 parsecs so that is 342 light years so it's pretty it's pretty nearby it's like in our it's like in our neighborhood thank you so much thank you for taking the time to talk so on thursday the paper that i'm presenting on hs hydra that i talked about yesterday we're doing a press release we're part of a press panel which is really cool and you should definitely check it out it'll be live streaming on the AAS's youtube channel i'll put a i'll put a link down below i've had some press for my work but i've never presented anything at the meetings that is press worthy. So this is something new and cool that I'm getting to do at the meeting this year. And it's really fun to get to talk about your work and they ask they ask good questions about the story and about the data and about the people involved and you know the people. It always, that's it, I always bring it back to the people. Today I'm thinking a lot about presentation, about how we show what we do. This comes in lots of forms. Data visualization. Adrian's talk this morning, it was just so loaded with amazing data visualizations. The data from Gaia and from the legacy surveys. I just, I have always loved that picture of Palomar 5 and the tidal tails that stick out. It just tells such an amazing story about the dynamics of this globular cluster as it's going and plunging through the galaxy and getting ripped apart. And I don't work in that area much anymore, but that field has continued to really blossom. And as Adrian said this morning, there's over 60 tidal tails known from various clusters and merging galaxies and space debris just floating around in the galactic halo. It's really, really cool. Every one of those tails tells a story about the galactic gravitational potential, and that's incredibly valuable for weighing the galaxy and measuring the mass and the mass profile of the galaxy. It's a wonderful story, and in my mind, all driven by that data visualization, by that graph, by that streak through this field of like snow. It's really cool. Then, also hanging out in my kitchen and making scones, I went to an exhibitor webinar put on by NASA on the behind the scenes of NASA's travel bureau posters. And as the presenters were saying, they really sparked the imagination of the audience while also conveying the information. I mean, they're fanciful and kind of silly. Like, we're not really going to go on a balloon ride over 55 Cancri E. But look at this picture. Look at this story that it's telling. And like, most importantly, look. Look how there's people in the frame interacting with and viewing the planet, like enjoying the cosmos. It's incredibly engaging, and I think it's a really, I think it's a really powerful outreach tool to talk about the science and why it's cool and why it means so much to those people who study it. Sharing the science is really important, practically speaking, because we need funding to do the science. And But I think the connection between art and science is actually deeper than just these posters and the data visualizations and the cool graphs that we make and the stories that we tell. I think a lot of what we do as scientists is more closely related to what you might think of as art. And I say that with the utmost pride. Understanding the universe and the cosmos is like music. You probably don't have to do it to survive, but it's one of the things we do to make life worth living, to make the human experience rich and beautiful and textured because people cannot help but sing 
and make art and make music. And almost everybody goes outside and looks up and says, wow. And I think in a lot of ways, those two things are kind of the same. Every time I see these great visualizations, these art posters, or an amazing graph, or an amazing YouTube video explainer from Dr. Becky or David Kipping talking about how the universe works, that's sparking people's understanding and creativity, I think that's what we're supposed to do. Discover, reflect, and share. My name is Mary Beth Lechak. I am the Director of Strategic Communications of the Canada-France Hawaii Telescope. We have an exhibit booth, Zooms twice a day, special session Zooms where we're presenting information about us. One webinar is tomorrow by our Director of Science Operations. And then on Thursday, Jennifer Marshall, our project scientist for our Mauna Kea Spectroscopic Ex Explorer project is doing a webinar, Chasing Rainbows, the Mauna Kea Spectroscopic Explorer. Chasing Rainbows, I love that. Why do, why do you spend so much effort communicating with the public and with other scientists? How can I see you at AAS every single year? Um, that's a, you know, it's a really deep question. I actually gave a talk yesterday and at our booth that we'll post soon, where I talked about, you know, a lot of the outreach efforts that we did at CFHT. I run a program called Mauna Kea Scholars that provides telescope time to Hawaii public high school students right. um, on the Mauna Kea Ooh. observatories collectively. Uh, that program I've been running for six years. It is my baby. Um, and this year we're struggling with it. One of my Mauna Kea scholar students a couple years ago comes up to me and she says afterwards, she's like, you know, miss, this was amazing. I was really into science until I was in fourth grade. And then I stopped being good at it. <laughs> and, and, you know, oh, no. now I'm like interested again. And I think to myself, what happened when you were nine? Yeah. Who made you feel like science wasn't for you? And so I'm not looking for a million little astronomers. I'm looking for a million little kids that wonder and have that question about the universe and that really understand the scientific method. Found your YouTube channel here, so I'll make sure to put that put that link. Uh, I'll put the link down below. You should go check it out. Um, you have a bunch of stuff up here now. <laughs> you have like a lot of videos. We've done 53 videos. We've also done some live events. We did a really fabulous one with the um, Phosphine Venus team. And oh, so cool. regardless of where people <laughs> fall, uh -huh. on that spectrum. I would encourage people to watch it because rarely do you have an academic discussion about penguin poop. <laughs> At least not amongst astronomers. <laughs> correct, correct. Please visit the exhibit hall booths. There are real human beings behind each of them that is sitting there wanting to talk to you about anything you want, literally. I can't go an entire session without showing <laughs> the non-stuffed planet that we have. His job was going to be when I traveled in 2020 to be kind of a proxy. Well, welcome, Grogu. I hope you have a good double ass. All right. Well, thank you so much, James, and have a good conference. You too. It was good to chat with you today. All right. That's it for me for day two at double AS. And the rest of my day, I think, is uh, get a quick bike ride and play with my kids for the rest of the afternoon. Tomorrow... Wednesday, 2.40 to 3.10 Eastern Time. We're going to do a virtual coffee break at our gather town. So astronomers at AS237, come hang out with us and have some coffee. And if you're not at the meeting, just DM me on Twitter and I'll send you the link. See you there.